Hey everybody, welcome to Build It Better Architecture. Uh, I am Lindsay Wardell, software engineer at This Dot Labs. We have a great show for you today talking about the architecture of progressive web apps, mobile apps, doing some compare and contrast and the importance of each and pushing forward the modern web today. Uh, with me today is Walter Cuppins, Jesse Tomchok, Simone Cuomo, and Chandler Baskins, all from This Dot. We've got a This Dot panel today, and we're just gonna dive right in and start talking about uh, mobile web and progressive web apps and comparison against mobile apps that is going on today. There's a lot of discussion going on and I feel it's important to kind of come together and talk about what we can do to build better experiences for our users. So opening the floor to anyone who wants to start. That's what it's all about, right? Just building a better experience for the user uh, and also like making our lives easier, right? So. Uh, I think that's like one of the great things about PWAs is, you know, like if you're using React View or Angular, you write one code base and, and you know, keep in mind the mobile aspect of it, right? And then, yeah, and then turn it into a PWA. And then, I mean, I'm not saying your job's done at that point, but as you're developing that app and keeping in mind, uh, like you're not having to double back for a native app, right? So you're not duplicating your efforts, uh, and you're not lo you're not losing some things across the way, right? So like if you if you built your web app first, or the native app first, you and forgot to add something to either one, you know. So like that that's one of my arguments for PWAs is like one code base, two different platforms. I think to add on that is um, is also inclusion. So with native app, we, we we require specific devices. We require people to have spaces, and we know that there are quite big differences across across the globe. With PWA, is accessible. If people don't have space, people can just access its website. Um, and also, we need to we're, we need to think what comparison we're making. So I think for a consumer perspective. Um, we really don't mind as long as it's what you know what they really you know uh, the the needs for us is to have something that is nice, quick, and doesn't use too much space, or you know that that's what we need. But the real um, the real implication is for the for the big for the for the big or corporate for Google for Apple for what they've been drive, trying to drive the native because native has not been driven by uh, uh, by companies uh, by developers, but it seems to be been driven by iHub, like we know with all the cases and things that has gone out. Uh, so I think this is really who is who who are the, who is who are the people fighting the consumers versus the big corporate, and you know, what is your thought on that? I think the I like someone's take that like the consumer is the front line, and like if you think about mobile web, um, you know, most of us on this panel have a fairly new device. I would say a device in a year or two that is probably on the higher spectrum. Um, we are in what the top 5%, right? We talk about most people's only internet connection is their mobile phone. And it is not the newest, latest phone, right? Uh, the, you know, the average phone is like a Motorola G4 when we talk about globally. Um, and you just can't build a heavy web application that isn't lean and light, that isn't, that, you know, that's dumping giant images, right? So mobile web is more than just progressive with web apps. It's a conscious effort to tighten up the requirements. And, you know, it looks, it looks fine on my brand new MacBook Pro in 2021, uh, which means it's, it's not going to load on 90% of devices across the world. Like that's just like, you know, 10, 19 seconds to get this page load. I think there's a real disconnect between the work I'm doing at my desk and ideally the people that are actually going to use this on the other end. Um, so I, you know, native offers a different set of trade-offs, you know, when Chandler was talking about, uh, you know, build once and deploy everywhere, like things like react native and, and uh, capacitor from Ionic is build one and a half, I would say, right. There's, you know, we've worked on react native apps. There's, you build the base code and then you are making divergence for 
both code bases, right? For iOS, for Android and for web, right? There's a third, right? There's, there's, it's, it's never Java, right? Once run anywhere, there's always a code base per the platform. And I think if you target the web as a platform, you, you get far more bang for your buck. Um, but then you have to do it well, and it has to be lean and it has to be loadable and it has to be offline. And there's a lot like, you know, as developers, we talk about how difficult testing is mostly to, to set it up, but to set up a good project that is lean and light and conscious, I would argue is even more exhaustive and more frustrating today, even with the tool stack we have, um, in spite of the tool stack we have. It's setting up a project that does all these things well and keeps you in check is really hard. Uh, and it is not a high priority for most projects, most customers, most companies, uh, customers, most companies, right? They they want the product, the features out the door. And then below the fold is accessibility. Below the fold is better load times. And only if it affects the bottom line, do those items become more prominent, right? Uh, anyway, I think one of the big issues that we have as web developers primarily coming into the, uh, the mobile ecosystem is that we're very used to that constant internet connection. We, when we're creating an app, we're not thinking, oh, I need to cache this, I need to cache that, I need to store all of this data unless we're very specifically thinking about a mobile experience. Uh, kind of like what you were saying, Jesse, we, we think first about desktop because that's what we're developing on. That's where we're rendering our, our experience as we're working. So unless we put in a lot of effort mentally to, to shift our paradigm to the, this is mobile, this is going to be a slow experience. I need to store this. I need to prevent multiple requests. I need to make sure that restarting our experience is going to be fast as well. Um, then the, the, even using a progressive web app, if you're not doing all of the, the caching and you're not doing all of the preloading that you can so that when they're using the experience, it feels like it's a native experience, they're not going to want to use it. They're going to want to go back to a native experience. I think the other thing that drove native over mobile back in the beginning was slow internet connections. I'm going to download the app and I don't need to go and get it again. I don't need to refetch that JavaScript. Uh, and I think that's that's a paradigm that a lot of people are just used to at this point. And part of the, the barrier to getting progressive web apps out to customers is this completely different way to find them. You can't typically put them into the app store. You can't download them in the same way. You have to do it through a specific browser with a special function. And I think a non-technical user getting that, that pop-up message is, oh, you can install this. I'm not running an app. Why are you asking me to do this? I don't, and they're just gonna close it. They're gonna think it's a pop-up like from the 90s. Um, I think that's one of the, the, those are the big hurdles that I see to progressive web apps really uh, pushing into the ecosystem. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's one of the drawbacks of PWAs is we don't, there's not a central store, right? Like you don't go to the Google Play or like the iOS app store. But I've heard of a joint venture uh, of, of trying to make this more doable, right? Of a central store. Uh, I don't I don't quite remember. I want to say it was Google in um, uh, partnering, partnering up with somebody. Uh, so that there is a there is a PWA store, right? And that the experience would be just like you go to the store, you hit install, and then yeah, you got the you got that you got the P, PWA on your phone. Do you think um, you need a central store? Because like we talk about PWAs and like organically going to a website and then coming back and getting the prompt to install. Like I feel like Android has the right model where it is prompt to install application. And what they're doing is is just adding the PWA to your desktop, right? And then it gets file access, right? It's an incremental sort of thing. Um, and and my, you know, Microsoft is obviously aggregating their manifest files um, in the Microsoft Store. Um, I, I think the centralizing an aggregation would almost do more harm than pushing, because then, then what you end up with is another centralized, like, oh, now I need to submit my app to Android, Google, Play Store, and then this third party manifest that will arbitrarily decide that my app is redundant or doesn't, right? Like the best part about PWAs is it's the open web, right? There is no central gate, you know, as much as Google is the, the de facto, 
And you don't have to Google. You can duck, duck, go, or just go. You can literally just go to the website. Um, I think that shouldn't be uh, overlooked as the power of an installable progressive web application. You can I think use that in big... tandem. To, oh, sorry, um, but you can use that in tandem with like app stores as well, right? So you can offer that experience where you install the app by visiting it, but you can also like have that same PWA show up inside the Google Play Store as well. And if you install from there, it's the same, you know, exact application, just two different ways of getting it. I think the the big issue with having people go to websites to download things is that over the last decade or so, we've trained users not to do that. Um, in Al Alex Russell gave a talk, the Mobile Web MIA, uh, which for those who are, are watching this, we're kind of referencing without mentioning at this point. We're, we watched it. We uh, highly recommend it as well uh, if you want to check it out and have a deeper understanding of what we're talking about. Um, but in that, he, he showed an Android phone uh, just on his desktop. And there was a search bar at the top, which he labeled as answers. So if you want answers, you're going to do a Google search. But if you want experiences, you click on the Google Play Store. And I think that's that's the real disconnect, is that people go to Google when they want answers, when they want something more like Wikipedia or song lyrics or how to do something in JavaScript, looking at us as developers. Whereas if we want the weather, or we want a weather app, or we want notifications of something, or we want an experience with our bank, or we want you know anything like that, that's more of an experience. And you're going to click on the Google Play Store more often than you're going to go to Google. And if you do go to Google, it's to find an app that is then on the App Store. Um, I, th I think the other point to that is we've trained users that going online to find apps is dangerous, which inherently it is. Uh, especially if you're using a, a desktop operating system like Windows or Mac OS. Uh, if you can just download anything and install it on your computer, that's going to be more dangerous than anything that is reviewed and approved of by Apple or Google on the uh, mobile stores. I would almost push back a little bit and say, like, there's certainly less malware from the stores but I don't believe it is any less dangerous for the user. Um, iOS is a famous gatekeep store that is highly curated, uh, but it wouldn't take more than five minutes for, I think for any of us to find a garbage app that would want to uh, enroll us in a five or $10 weekly subscription to be a calculator or to you know, take a take a screenshot or like any number of of low value utilities, um, and that I would argue that that's detrimental to the customer in a different way. the The security of mobile phones is inherently in like their architecture of sandboxed applications, which Android does this and iOS does this, and you know malware is is literally you know there are no kernel extensions. Um, malware is contained to those applications, and they. You know, they can ask for your contacts um, and you grant them contact access and you grant them access to your photos and you grant them, right? There's levels of grants on a mobile device that we're far more willing to tolerate than our desktops. Um, you know, and, and I, I think the app store itself is, I would say not any more secure or, or than just the, than the web itself. And, and I feel like getting over that hurdle is, is a big lift for the web community um, to, re, to retrain people that, that the web is fine, right? We've been doing payments online for 30 something years. If you asked Apple, they would, they would say like, well, we went from CDs to the app store. And what they're missing is two decades of e-commerce that has slowly been built and put, we all put our credit cards on online through Shopify or eBay or through other things. Like there, there are valid ways to do it. Now, are there crappy parts that, that steal your identity? Yeah, but I would argue the same things that exist inside of the curated store uh, that is secure. Um, those things happen, they will always happen. Um, you know, it, it's just a matter of how well you've trained your users as a community, I think. I think um, both from Lindsay and Jesse, you both raised the, the concern that the, the users are not trained enough. 
So on one hand, the user doesn't know they need to, but when it says add to screen, it means add the PWA. And Jesse, you say the user doesn't know the, the flexibility that people nowadays have to ask and allow permission. So of course, when you download an application, it's much easier to see the permission. But even when you go to PWA, nowadays it's as easy as clicking on the top and choosing what permission you want to give the camera, you don't want to give the camera permission. But we know probably because we've been we've been we've been writing that code. We say, but if I see my mom, she has no idea whatsoever. So my mom will click the ad. For example, she did have a couple of PWAs on her, on, on her desktop, and she say, but I haven't downloaded it. I, I didn't download the app. She didn't know because she has an Android phone, so it's easy for her to click the ad on on, on desktop. Um, and that's something we haven't we haven't really touched upon is um, this discussion of being PWA hybrid and uh, and native um, has been going on for quite a few years, probably since uh, you know since probably I'll say five six years if no more. Um, we need to realize that PWA is reaching a moment of maturity now, so. What you can do that really looks native with PWA, you couldn't do it two to three years ago. Um, and I've uh, I've been involved in a project where, um, you know, they, they just threw away their $20,000 uh, native app because it was done by third party. And they just used internal guys to do a PWA. It worked the same because they didn't need any permission whatsoever. The only thing they needed is a form. So these are things that people, even actual company, they don't understand that. PWA is ready, what we need is one, consumers to understand it, and two, the big player to allow the usage of it. So, uh, you know, Android is nice and easy to install it. Unfortunately, with Google, uh, with uh, Apple, it's not. So the truth is this, is the market has been driven by the big companies. Uh, and personally, you know, I think they are ready. They're ready to be pushed forward. And the faster they get pushed forward, the more uh, feature they will actually get implemented and go forward. But how do we make the how, how, how do we help the consumers to, you know, what needs to be done for the consumers to actually go forward? For the consumers to say, oh yeah, this is out to screen and it's safe. Yeah, that's a hard question though. You know, it's like, <clears throat> how do we tell people, hey, this is safe, this is, you know, um, it's a native experience, right? Or like, I guess, I guess when you start bringing up the benefits of PWA, right? Maybe you can start opening some eyes. Uh, like the Twitter PWA is a lot smaller than the Twitter app, right? And on phones, right? Most phones nowadays, space is finite. We don't have the ability to add SD cards like we used to. Uh, especially like on, on Apple devices. I don't think you've ever had that ability, right? Uh, I know on Android, the last phone I had to add an SD card was the LG G5. And this was like forever ago, right? Before I was even a developer. So like a space, space is finite and people, I mean, if you look at somebody's storage on their phone, what are the two things that they're using, right? Probably pictures and apps. So and people don't want to delete their pictures. Uh, they'll always go for deleting an app that they don't use that much, you know, and then install it later, right? So like, I guess like bringing up the benefits, we can start telling people, uh, hey, try out the PWA. It's going to save you a lot more space. And we, there is another use case that we need to think. It's not just about the space. So um, I travel to Southern Europe during the summer and internet is horrendous. And of course, it's not my country. So that means that sometimes I may have to use applications that are not my application. So once I had to get a bus, the bus website would not give you the timetable. You had to get the app. So I'll go and download this app. It was a 36 megabyte app. Now I'm on roaming, 36 megabyte app. Internet is extremely slow. Why if I just want to see a timetable? So we also need to understand that there is, a, even if we don't just want to remove completely the app store, there is a need there is a, a place with the consumer where people may want to use an app once. People want to do usage of once. In that case, even just a web app will be fine, not a PWA. But again, it doesn't seem to be the ability. Like you said, Lindsay, if you want a feature, it has to be an app. The, the, you know, the, 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 the website was just to say, you need to download the app if you want to see the timetable. But I wanted the timetable. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I just read. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say, I'll bring up, Rob has been talking about, uh, like for your local mom and shop pop, you're not gonna download their app, you know, you're gonna go to their website. And do they really need to spend the money 
to have a mobile app developed for them? Probably not. You know, you're only going to use it once, right? So, like, why? What's the point? So, sorry. Oh, you're good. I was going to say er earlier today, I was needing to join a Telegram group chat. So, and, and I had the link to it in my browser. I was like, okay, I'll just open up Telegram and let me, let me create an account and I'll just sign it. You can't do that without either a desktop or a mobile app. And with a desktop app, you can't sign in unless you have the mobile app. So first I downloaded a desktop app, then I downloaded a mobile app, set up the mobile app, set up the desktop app. Finally, I'm in my group chat. But it's, it's definitely not an ideal process, especially when we're talking about cross-platform use. I think that's one of the things that uh, tools like Slack really got knocked out of the park is you have a mobile app, which is basically the same as the desktop app, which is the same as the web app. And they all have slightly different functionality because of their environments, but it all it all flows together really nicely. You're able to, to travel between the devices. But again, that's not something that most people are running into. Most people are going to have one device that they're wanting to use something on, either a desktop or more likely a mobile device. Um, yeah, it's a great point. Discord does it really good too. They Discord, do, yeah. Discord's uh, web app and then their mobile app. And I think some people, they don't realize that in the drive to move people to their native app, they're creating a really bad experience. And I mean, like if I'm forced to download an app, I'm probably just not going to, right? Like if I can use it on the web, I, and especially especially as somebody that sits you know, at a computer most of the day, I'm hardly ever on my phone, right? So, I mean, I think you kind of alienate some of your consumers if you're forcing them. So we've been talking around uh, this issue of just comparing the two and some good examples on each side. Uh, one of the points that Alex Russell made in that talk that I mentioned earlier, the mobile web MIA, is the web can't play to win when Apple sets the rules. And a lot of what we've been talking about with PWAs applies specifically to Android, where you can go to a website, you can install the app. This doesn't work on Apple at the moment. Hopefully it will in the near future, but PWAs just do not have the support on Apple devices that they do on Android devices. What can we as developers look at to do to try and overcome this obstacle? Obviously people won't be able to install the apps on their Android or their Apple phones, but what can we do to help raise this issue and try and push people towards at bare minimum requesting of Apple that this be supported in mobile Safari. I find the best course of action is to get on Twitter and rant uh, hysterically. That's, uh, that's my go-to. Um, but you're right, Apple is actively hostile to the web at this point. I don't think it's a uh, over saying, overstating it to say that they are actively hostile towards mobile web applications and with their insistence and crippling of web APIs and standard web technologies, right? These aren't, you know, when we talk about things happening on Android, they're not on Android because they're proprietary. They're just open web standards that they, at this point, refuse to acknowledge and implement. Um, honestly, I don't know what to do to, uh, Apple's going to get pushed into it via regulation at, at a certain point. Um, you know, they have a single JavaScript core engine that everyone is required to run. So like your Chrome and Firefox browsers on iOS are not running Chromium and they're not running Spider or Servo. They're running JS core. They're basically just wrappers. Um, so like there is a deep, like the stranglehold goes really deep on this platform and it's, and it's not getting it much better. Um, honestly, I don't know what to do other than get on Twitter and complain. Well, traditionally, their argument has been for security, but I think people like kind of realize that's not really entirely the case because, you know, it also keeps them, allows them to keep a stranglehold on, you know, the entire ecosystem by preventing people from running their own engines. So it's not really just security in this case. Yeah, I mean, security, the device is already sandboxed to an application, right? The, the security they talk about is in policy, which is not security it like the device and the way it was built you know 15 years ago inherently is more secure than mac because it of the lack of kernel extensions because of the lack of uh root access to the device right it, it is not 
their policy decisions are not based are different than the security implementation of the OS. And I think it's important to know the difference. Right. So you said they'll get pushed into it via regulation eventually. So unfortunately, like big companies like Apple can hold off on this for a long time, right? I mean, they have the money to put up and legal fees and court battles. And, you know, it just, I wonder, besides the Twitter ranting, which seems like a really good option, right? Like if we get enough people as a whole, right? Start yelling. I wonder if there's other options, right? Uh, there is um, a, a, a part of the fight that, um, you know, that, that maybe we, there's more chance for PW this time um, to win against Apple. And the reason is there is no extra knowledge needed to do PWA. Apart from, of course, there are some, some small things that you have to learn. But what I mean is, is web developers. PWA is driven by web developers. So it's not like we're trying to push for a new language. And the people that will take this language, they will lose the job. So in two, three years, we'll lose Apple, the game Apple. This can stay for years. This can wait for the, re the regulation to be, actually take place. This has no rush whatsoever to go forward. So maybe in here, there is a better possibilities because it's driven by the web. We've seen how the web is progressing. So we can see how this can push up. The only way in which Apple will be forced to adopt PWA for a market perspective um, will be when they will be application that will be available on the web and on PWA and not on the Apple Store. When the balance tipped, that is very hard to tip because we know that Apple is quite strong. But if the balance will ever tip, then of course Apple will have to some you know accept the, the loss. But we've seen until now that Apple is quite strong and they're able to drive that market quite high. But as soon as something like that will happen and the clients start to actually go on the website, is then because there is no app, then when the problem will probably arise for Apple and when the big decision will be taking place. I think one of the big examples that, that kind of shows what you're talking about, Simone, is Hey.com um, going through their issues with the App Store last year. Uh, for those who weren't aware, Hey, a new email service from Basecamp, released, there was a there was an app, there was the web app. Uh, they're not even a PWA, if I remember right. They're just straight up Ruby on, uh, on a website. But they had a mobile experience. And Apple tried to put that down because Hey was wanting to charge people without that money going through the app store. It was going to go straight through their own uh, system for, for collecting subscriptions and things like that. And that became a huge fight. And DHH was talking quite regularly about how frustrating the Apple App Store experience was from that perspective. Uh, and eventually, Basecamp won. And Hey has a mobile app that was able to do more or less what they wanted. They had to make some uh, concessions to Apple. I think the big thing that Apple looks, like, looks at uh, when they're looking at PWAs and whether they should support it or not is we can't charge for this. We can't get our 30% tax on subscriptions going through to Netflix or Audible, for example. If you're using the, the PWA that we let you install, we don't have any cut of that. And granted, this, at this point, they have a lot of money, but they still want to make more. That's what a company does. And they want to make sure that they're able to uh, extract that amount from people using the apps on their platform. Yeah, I think something more positive uh, other than tw my Twitter ranting, because that will just always continue. Uh, is imagine, go, let's go back to last year and Clubhouse comes out and it is only available on the web as a web application. It is not in the I. So if, 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 for those who aren't familiar, it only launched their Android app in the last month or so. And it was iOS app only, was the only interactive platform for Clubhouse. Turn the tables and let's say that it launched as a progressive web app. And the features of going on stage and maybe hosting a room were only available if you had uh, audio APIs that were accessible through the web application. So your experience would have been vastly diminished on iOS because of their refu Apple's refusal to support those open web standards. And now you have, so fast forward a year, you, you need an application with people that want to use it you need a Clubhouse, a Twitter, a Facebook, the, the next hottest Instagram, TikTok, WYSIWYG, whatever it is, 
that is web only. And that experience needs to be so bad on iOS as to force Apple's hand. Like, hey, this app that everybody loves is fantastic. Uh, it's pretty crappy on iOS. Well, why don't you make a, a, a native app? Well, we're not going to. That's what you need. That's a great point. And I think, I think that is the more positive route and the one that's probably more likely to happen, right? If you just get a viral application that everybody loves and force Apple's hand uh, because, you know, Apple, that, that's a pretty big revenue stream for them, right? That 30% tax, but a bigger revenue stream is people buying iPhones, buying more iPhones, right? So like people, I mean, they'll, they'll switch, right? Uh, most of the time. So like what I, I used to work at Verizon and like we swapped people to Android and they had a much better experience. And sometimes they would go back to Apple, right? But if you give them a bad experience, you know, they'll probably swap. And Apple definitely doesn't want, want them to swap. Uh, isn't this happening outside the web ecosystem already with, um, uh, what is it, Epic Games and Apple, right? Like, uh, this is like a game specifically, not necessarily, but um, I think it still applies. It's like, you can't, like, obtain Fortnite on iOS, right? I think that's how it is currently because of that dispute with the microtransactions. So if people will have iOS devices and want to play Fortnite really bad on mobile, they really have no option other, they, they have to switch. They have no other option. That's all they can do right now. And eventually it's gonna start, um, you know, affect, affecting Apple probably has a lot actually already, you know, but they need to address that if they don't wanna lose their user base. I think that's the worst battle for Apple. And the reason for it is because the consumers are all young people. It's a big, you know, we're talking, we're not going to talk about 10, 20, we're talking about millions of players on and Epic Games, all of which are going to grow up and they're going to say, I'm not going to get an Apple because on X, Y, and Z. And you know, the market is very split up, isn't it? Market, uh, Android or Apple. When you take one of the two, it's the same of test script and iTouch script. If you take one of the two revenue, you will stay there for quite a long time. So if these people growing up, if these people actually deciding not to go on Apple, in the long run, we will see a big big drop in, in, in Apple. And then that's, that's when the, you know, the balance can actually tip over and Apple will not be able to drive these, these things anymore. Just you know, I was checking some uh, stats. So last year was 15, uh, almost 16% of the revenue were from services, such as the Apple payment and things. So quite a big chunk of money that they will be lost be, if we if the PWA. Yeah, and I wonder if the better strategy, like from a business perspective, is is instead of like let's stop this from happening, what's what's ways that we can recoup this money? Right. So we make and the next big knockout app in as a web platform. What are other things as developers that we can do to positively flex, positively move this needle? I don't know. It just like you kind of wonder as a developer what kind of power do you have right i mean you just, well i'm not going to write swift anymore right i mean people need jobs people need their money they have families to support so you can't have a mass exodus if nobody was writing applications for ios you know that would that would definitely move the hand right but just people can't do that more than writing application i would say is the bringing the price down so the example I was giving before where I, I consulted the company to go through a PWA, the price comparison was not like for like. So it wasn't like, oh, you can have a native app for the same price as a PWA, what do you want to do? The, we know that native is expensive. Native is a time, native is starting to become this that niche where who you need to have lots of money to create a, a, a proper application. If you want to do something very basic and you want to do a PWA or a website, the price comparison is big. So hopefully that's the one thing we can do is make it simple for people to actually have PWA out of the box. And something that, that I would say is there is still not enough PWA on the web. So not enough blog posts, not enough push. So there's not enough knowledge of PWA if you actually go and search for it. And this is probably the one thing that we can do as developers is really the same way as we did with accessibility. We've been trying to do responsiveness. It's trying for people to build it 
as they build the normal app. Even if they don't think it's going to be a PWA, think about it being a PWA in the future. If people start to get that into the day-to-day -day development, in the long run, yes, that's going to be amazing because it's going to bring the price down. You know, when someone say, I want an app, I say, oh, there's no point to go out. This was already PWA. Just give me a couple of weeks and do it. That's what is going to, you know, really win the battle. But uh, we need to keep writing. It's a great point, Simone. I think with the responsiveness, responsiveness, we've always thought mobile first, right? But like our mobile first mindset just kind of stopped at the layout, right? So if we if we continue that thought process, like like with caching and keeping in mind that you know most of the most of our users are going to be accessing our software through low quality or underpowered devices, right? And then we can build better applications. And I think that that would be a good driver. And then from a company standpoint, yeah, it makes total sense instead of spending 20, 50, 100 grand just to build a native app. If it's simple, just use what you have already. Yeah, I agree with uh, driving that mobile first concept. Uh, to its natural conclusion of, I am building this website for mobile on a low internet connection. I'm not developing it for myself on a large desktop running a Mac or uh, sitting here on 5G. I'm, I'm really, tar you know, plan your application for the target audience. Uh, one of the, the, the other points that Alex Russell made in that talk was um, JavaScript is a re regressive tax on content. The longer, it, the more JavaScript you have to download, the longer it takes for the application to run and that's when you start to see issues like if you're running your lighthouse scores against mobile 3G. You can actually see that impact, sort of, mostly, um, that your end user is going to use. And I think it's really telling. Uh, occasionally, I'll spin up like a Nuxt application or just some website that I've made. It's you know, supposed to be really lightweight. And it gets just terrible lighthouse scores because it's loading all of this JavaScript. It's making these API calls. And I think that's something we as developers also have power over because we're the ones building the apps. We can build them in a more mobile first, low internet first way um, just, just to try and cover this gap. Because I think that's, that's that plus the Apple issue are the two big things holding back progressive web apps in my opinion. Uh, if we can build our websites in a way that they're actually friendly to use on mobile, just like they're friendly to use on desktop with a high internet speed, then I think we're we're going to be in a much better position. And plus side, if you build it mobile first and it works on desktop and it's fast, then it's going to be even faster on desktop because you've built it to be fast. So win-win. Having it be a fast experience is very important too for newer markets where there's a lot of users who have traditionally never used the internet before are starting to use the internet only now. So if, you know, we talked about retraining people to learn how to install apps through a different way, but we also have to think about training people that haven't used the internet yet to install them the way that you want them to. And if you give them a bad experience on PWA their first time doing it, they're never gonna to wanna to try it ever again. And they'll just default to the app experience because they think it'll be better. So we need, that's another reason to make sure that, you know, performance like when it comes to JavaScript execution and also, you know, network usage, um, it's, it's very important to uh, prioritize that for sure. Great points. Yeah, I really like the if you're if you're building it with the low internet in mind, right? You're building it fast, so like when people access it, like like in our conditions, it's going to be super super fast. And then uh, I love the point where uh, there's going to be generations of people that aren't being retrained; they're going to be trained, right? There's going to be areas of people that we're training, and like it's a great opportunity to capitalize on. Right. Yeah, I think one of the one of the big points there is that if users can't use your application, then it's not accessible. We we talk a lot about accessibility uh, from a I need different feature sets in order to support all of the users, or I need to add alt text, or I need to add aria labels, but also just does the application load. Are we, are we providing information to the user as it loads? Uh, just small things like that, I think will go a long way. 
and and again i'll bring back the the my lovely holidays in the south of italy i cannot load any website they take it takes minutes it can actually take a couple of minutes to load the website it's it's you know we don't understand what we really mean by low um uh, you know uh, low speed low internet speed we don't understand when we say what we mean by very bad devices we work on very fast machine and you know i wanted to load facebook once i'm not a facebook user but i wanted to load facebook once after four minutes and a half i gave up because i could just see the headers and you know, you know, the headers, those things, they should have all been saved up. It, it's always the same, what's the point? But again, this is really what we need. We can all work to, towards. And what Jesse said, what can we do? This is our job. This is our, you know, I when I when I work on that consultancy that helped out on doing the PWA, I learned so much. I learned that there is index DB. I learned how simple it is to do uh, versioning with service worker. I learned how simple it is to do push notification and background background syncing. It's all there. It's all simple to use, all, all that are available to be able to really support the users that have a uh, slow internet. But, you know, how many of us can actually use it? I, I know about it, but I cannot use it already because the information is not out there. It's not as our bread and butter. It's the extreme, it's the elite. And that's what we need to really push forward. So all the Swift um, developer, all the developer native, they should go and start the, to fill up the gaps within the DPWA. I would say that if we don't figure out how to do this, yet the PWA, these web technologies that are out there with service workers and index DB and you know web APIs, if we don't figure this out in the next year or two, uh, I would say three tops, we are going to suffer the same fate with uh, WebAssembly on the web where the technology's there and it's available and nobody's using it. Hopefully with the uh, demise of Internet Explorer, we can start pushing things forward on desktop. And maybe once, as we get past that mindset of, I can only use these limited features because browsers don't support them, we can start pushing, like we've been talking, pushing Apple, pushing these companies to support more and more of the PWA features and actually get that rolled out to end users. That would be my hope. Real quick as we're wrapping up this episode, is there any, any case where we would prefer native? where we would prefer having a mobile application rather than a progressive web app? Or are we happy just being PWA all the way once it's supported? Oh, everyone unmuted themselves. Um, I would say for the PWAF, there's no difference. So really, if the PWA is available, I don't mind because um, I would prefer PWA person. So maybe we do around around table. I prefer PWA if they're there. I don't have any preferences. I haven't found a use case yet, uh, with the exception of maybe a, a, a mobile game. Uh, and I say that even hesitantly, but like that might be the only use case where native uh, GPU metal and API isn't available as a web API yet. Yeah, that's my same thought. If the uh, if we don't have the web API to support the feature, uh, whatever feature it is, you know, native would be. But I'm with Simone. I would prefer PWA. If they have it, uh, I'd rather use it. How about you, Walter? Oh, I'm repeating the exact same thoughts as everyone else because I was th also thinking of the gaming situation as well. So I can add to that argument as well and say, like, like even if there was a PWA version of a game available, would it really be that different of an experience? Because you'd just be end up downloading all the assets anyways. So you'd be waiting about the same amount of time, roughly, to load up the game on mobile web than you would be downloading Cloud, it the App Stadia. Store. Amazon's oh, little platform. Oh, that's actually a there really you go. good point. Stadia. Gaming, mobile gaming on the web is here, right? But that that's requires true. bandwidth, though. That's the thing. I, I I will not be able to play that game offline when I'm in southern Italy with Simone. I will that's not be true. able to do that. If you're in southern Italy with Simone, should you really be playing games, though? Yes, we're on the beach, and we're all playing Mario Kart. I, it, I see it in my head. I'm there. All right, let's go. <laughs> All right, we're all going to head out now to southern Italy and play Mario Kart on the beach. 
I uh, hope you all enjoyed this discussion about uh, PWAs and native mobile apps, and what we can do to overcome the difficulties that PWAs are having. And hope to see you again next time at Build It Better Architecture. See you next time. Bye-bye.